right, hello, uh, and welcome back to JNation 2020 online. Uh, my name is Leon and I will be hosting this session. So first of all, thank you if you've been following us here today. Um, and also big thanks goes out to our sponsor for making this event possible during these times. And finally, a huge, huge thanks also to the ones uh, who you came here to see at our live event, uh, in this case, it's Mary Griglaski and Oleg Dok Dokukan. Uh, hi, Mary, hi, Oleg. Uh, how are hey, you doing? Huh? Good, how are you, Leon? Good, good. Uh, I know that your guys, one is, one of you is in Chicago, the other one is uh, in Ukraine. So this is like we're having two speakers at the same time, but we have eight hours of difference. That's amazing. Yeah, yes. correct. Yeah. Yes. So um, earlier we had an introduction actually to reinforcement learning. Uh, and I think this your talk now is going to be a great example of how this can be actually applied. Um, so Mary and Oleg are gonna explain to us how to teach Pac-Man to play with machine learning and reactive streams. But just before we start, don't forget, you can ask any question on our room Slack or on YouTube, and I will make sure that they will get it by the end of the session. Um, Oleg, Mary, Mary, this virtual floor is yours, so good luck. Thank you for Thank intro. you, Leo. Thank you, thank you. Okay, so we'll start. And uh, first of all, thank you so much for attending our live session right now. Um, so I'm very happy to, today to with Oleg Dukuka, we'll be uh, doing this presentation on Teach Your Pac-Man to Play with uh, Machine Learning and Reactive Streams. Oops, Give me, bear with me a second, we're sharing screen. Oops, okay. So um, what is this uh, talk for? So we are really, it's for anybody who's curious about uh, machine learning and artificial intelligence. And if you're curious about doing better coding, using a better approach, and also um, primarily to uh, curious about distributed systems. And let me do a quick introduction about myself. I'm a developer advocate at IBM. And by night, I'm a community organizer. I'm, I uh, also am the president of the Chicago Java Users Group and also board member there. Um, and I or organize also events too for the IBM uh, meetup as well. So, and, and just a quick thing too, is that I, I met Oleg uh, in uh, Ukraine and Kiev. And so that's how we came together and I saw his amazing uh, presentation. So we started talking about doing a talk together. So I'm very honored. So now let, uh, let's have Oleg introduce himself. Yeah, thank you for sharing her for me, Mary. Uh, as she said, my name is Oleg. I'm from, from Kiev, from Ukraine. If you have never been there, I'm, I'm inviting you to visit Ukraine, to visit Kiev. This is a beautiful city. We have a lot of stuff to, to look at, like just to, to some sightseeing and so forth and so on, as well as you can spend your time pretty, pretty productively by visiting our conferences, which are pretty interesting. We have dialogues, we have many, many interesting conferences. So I'm inviting you to, to join my, my country and my city. But uh, in the meanwhile, um, yeah, this talk about machine learning, but to be honest, I'm not a machine learning expert. I'm reactive programming expert. I'm a big, big fan of uh, Project Reactor. I'm a contributor to this project. Right now I'm leading our socket project. Uh, so if you have never heard, I will quickly explain what is that in this talk. And in general, I'm a big reactive fan so I'm so big fan, so I've wrote a book about reactive programming in Spring, but this is a side story. Nevertheless, yeah, let's stop talking about us and let me quickly introduce what we are going to talk during this, uh, during this presentation. So first of all, this is talk about Pacman. So we will quickly, uh, we will be quickly, quickly look at why Pacman is a good, good kind of source for machine learning still. Then we will be looking at different machine learning approaches in, in the context of, of specific version of Pacman that we have today. And finally, we will be figuring out how reactive streams is related to all this stuff at all. So that's what we will be doing during, during this session. So if you're interested, still with, stay with us and Mary. So I guess the main question is why Pacman is, is a good source for machine learning then? Sure. So yes. So as we all know, Pac-Man is not a new game. It was invented back in the 70s uh, by a Japanese engineer in Tokyo. Um, and it was a video game at that time, but Namco. 
Um, and I'm sure too, um, all of you or most of you have at least uh, heard of it and have played. In fact, uh, even to this day, it's still very popular because it's actually quite simple, not that complicated. It's undeterministic uh, behavior of ghosts and Pac-Man makes it kind of an ideal um, uh, platform for doing uh, research, especially for like AI and ML researchers. Um, and uh, as such, too, um, because of this simple, simple uh, way of doing things, it, it's just the, the, the possibility are many. So from a computation perspective, you don't even need like an IBM cluster machine to run it. You can actually set it up and run it on your local machine. You can run it single, you know, locally and not even like running um, over the network, for example. So it's, it's a very good candidate for uh, research in, in this field. And because of its uh, popularity, even to this day, you'll find that there are still team competition. Competition, for example, Ms. Pacman versus Ghost Team competition for the CIG uh, organization in uh, 2018, and that's with IEEE. Um, so, uh, so as you can see, it is a, a, a popular game, and even to this day, and it's just uh, simple enough to study about the complexity um, that's uh, behind, you know, like the, a lot of systems. This sounds really interesting. However, isn't that solved yet? I mean, we've done, like humanity, we've done a lot of research about Pac-Man. The, the game was developed so so far from nowadays. So do we have to solve anything? You know, why we should perform this talk, basically? Can you t tell yeah. us, Marie? Sure. So it is very true. I think I'm sure that some of you, if you are, you know, have not come to our talk before or, or kind of thought about it, if you think about it, you, you probably are wondering, well, Pac-Man is already there. There are so many variations of the game and out there. So why are we still using Pac-Man? Isn't the problem solved? So the thing is, the problem, yes, it, if you like doing on a local machine, a very simplistic way, single user, single player and all these, yes, they are kind of soft. Um, and of course, you can still improve um, upon it just like any other thing. But say for if you think take a look at the way the computing world is going, um, in, in you know, in the recent 10, you know, 12 years, uh, the hardware has become so sophisticated. There are multi-core machines and multi-CPUs, and we even bring machines into like, you know, virtual level, virtualization, containers, and cluster and all that. So basically, the, the scenario, the environment is ripe for like even more um, challenging situation of designing these games. And so um, if you think about it, then we, we're entering this distributed system space. And in fact, um, when you talk about, you know, when, when we talk about this and um, I, I've actually seen Oleg did a great talk on do, using a multiplayer uh, Pac-Man and that's also, it's something very new that I'm sure back in 70s, they would never have thought of a multiplayer game. So if you, as you can see, like it's the possibility is many. There are challenges are out there to make this game even, you know, bring it up to many levels up. So yeah, and in fact, let's go back. And Oleg, you you did this presentation on a multiplayer Pac-Man, and that's how I came to know you. So maybe you can tell us more about this uh, particular uh, work that you've done and how it absolutely, moved. absolutely. So the story was the following: um, I was thinking how to how to show the power of R socket protocol, and I decided to implement multiplayer version of Pac-Man because nowadays there is like kind of a trend of of playing different games in a distributed environment, so we decided why not to try and why not to implement multiplayer version of Pac-Man using this powerful protocol, and I've done it. So let me quickly introduce what I got. First of all, from, from, from uh, how it works per perspective, I created a um, browser game because many, many, many people have, have mobile phones where they have browsers. Many, many, many of us has computers, so basically everyone can play the game in browser because it's it's convenient way of doing that. Uh, by this, it means that if we have browser, we have to have a server. And the communication is pretty simple. We open our browser, the web page is loaded, server pushes back all the important information that we need to, to have on the client side, and that's it. In order to start playing, we say, start playing, put our name. So we have first interaction between client and server, exchange the important data that we have to exchange. So we got a state. And then in order to start playing, we have to send some information. Basically, we have to move. And once we move, we have to, to say here, we here, 
now we we at this point and and to, so forth and so so basically the logic is pretty common many games that we have nowadays are implemented in this way so as we move we send updates from our client to our server about where we are and the server then makes all the decisions so it means that in order to to see how other players moves so we have to send back all the updates so we have this this stream of updates from our server to our client so it, it kind of multiplex all the actions from all the clients back to our computer and of course we have the most important part in this game this is scoreboard so server makes all the decision about what what pills you eat in and how many uh, points you get from from that action as well as if you play for ghost for example you, you should chase the ghost and you got own score for for eating or chasing a ghost so this is how it works However, it seems a little bit different from what we observed like at the very beginning. So let me let me shortly introduce the, the game role. Yeah, in general, it seems pretty common. However, there is some 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 sp specific cases that I have to have to have to have to to say basically. First of all, in general, this is two dimension environment, so you you can move upright, left down, so nothing special in here. Then the main goal of, of a ghost in this particular case is to collect as many pills as is possible. And of course, another goal of, of ghost is, is not to, to, to die. So the goal is to survive. And of course, ghosts have to have to run out from uh, Pac-Man have to run out from ghosts. And of course, there is some specific cases. Of course, the goal of ghost is to, to, to chase the Pac-Man or many in, or some Pac-Mans. But in general, there is some exclusions from this rule. So you, you have some options where you can try to chase a ghost. So basically there is super pills as in the original game. So you can, you can turn the, 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 the chase in direction in a different, different, different way and you can start chasing ghosts for, for a few minutes or a few seconds. In general, it sounds pretty, pretty similar. However, I say that there is some differences from, from between this game and the original one. First of all, um, this is multiplayer game. It means that there can be a few Pac-Mans, a few ghosts, and this is real players. So they have to communicate. There is many computers communicating with each other. This is the first thing. Then we have infinite gameplay. Infinite gameplay means that there is no end as in the original game. So there is no levels. There is different maps, of course, but there is no levels. You have to play, you have to get the, the highest score, and you have to survive as long as possible. So this is uh, the main goal that you have to follow. And for example, if you want to write an agent, we have to take all these specific cases into account. So yeah, that's that's what I have to tell about the game that I implemented, Mary. Yes. Uh, and yeah, I want to shortly show that it really works because this is this is not just a fake fake, it's a real game. So I'm welcoming everyone who is watching this, this stream to scan this link or to just, just copy paste this short link and you'll be able to, uh, to, to join this online game with us and play simultaneously with us. So if you, if you follow this link, you will be able to access public web page. What, what you should do, you have to put your name, as I said before. Uh, this this kind of the first setup, and then you'll be able to to start playing. Of course, as 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 you start joining this uh, this game, uh, you'll be able to play only for Ghost because our mission for today is to write an agent for for Mrs. Buckman, right? Right. So in the meanwhile, while while you are joining, let me go back to to slides, and my first question to you, Mary. What machine learning approaches do we have today in order to implement this, this machine learning agent taking into account all everything that I said about the, the, the game? Sure. So yes, so let's take a look at some um, uh, machine learning approaches uh, for doing like designing and implementing um, 
pigment controllers. And so that's that's the area we're trying to address here. Not that, first of all, not that we're experts in machine learning, but we find it to be so interesting. We started um, studying about it and uh, also uh, trying to come up with a best uh, way of doing uh, what we're trying to achieve today. So let's take a look at some you know background information. So there, these are the different approaches. So if you're familiar with uh, machine learning and some of these uh, uh, approach, uh, you you probably can take a look into this, and this is the list of what we have uh, kind of done some study on. First of all, too, uh, let's take a look uh, at the simplest case. is a rule-based uh, kind. So as such, rule-based is actually a, sort of a brute force way of doing things. Essentially, it comp comprises of like if-then uh, statements in your, you know, in your code, it gets translated to that. But as you can see, if it is like doing if then, then basically it requires you to have knowledge of your domain very well. And you have to know like, you know, every single possible moves and then basically code it accordingly. So let, let's take a look. So you'd be wondering, well, what are some of the examples? So here it is. Yeah, with IBM, there was a deep loop that was back in uh, 1997, 96 in that time frame. So if you are a chess enthusiast, you are familiar with Deep Blue because it was a machine that was totally dedicated to um, serving the, the purpose of playing a chess game. And that one is basically not, nothing like fancy AI techniques. It was simply uh, a rule-based machine. But nonetheless, you know, it, it serves as a very good, as a starting point for the whole, you know, the research um, get into here and, and, you know, a good way of studying it. So as it turns, turns out too, if you're familiar with it or if you're not familiar with it, um, the Deep, Deep Blue was designed as a chess uh, machine. And uh, basically the highlight of it was that uh, Kasparov at the time was the chess champion of the world. And so uh, long story short, IBM and uh, Kasparov, like they challenged each other. And initially it actually was Carnegie Mellon, that team of folks who, who did this uh, deep thought. And then so they did it so well, even though they lost. Um, so that's how then IBM invited them. So IBM then now says, well, we're gonna invite Kasparov, the best chess player, we'll play against it, we can beat it. And so the story goes is that, Kasparov got defeated, you know, and of course it got kind of got him quite upset. And so he kind of demanded, or in some ways is asking IBM, well, can you, we need a rematch, it's unfair and all that, but IBM decided to retire the machine. So that was the story. But yeah, so the point of bringing this up is to just show you an example of a Ruby's machine dealing with uh, handling like artificial intelligence, machine learning algorithms. And uh, again, uh, the, the thing with about it, it's kind of that it wouldn't, you know, be, be able to take a, a, a primary, uh, you know, kind of uh, importance in the field of computing because it just requires a lot of heavy domain knowledge. And in today's world, when you have complex systems, if you need a rule base, then it will be simply the machines will run out of memory. So let's then take a look at the next uh, thing. It's a Monte Carlo tree search. Um, as such, Monte Carlo tree search are essentially not like you know one single approach. It's essentially taking the essence of two, Monte Carlo and then a tree search approach. So let's first take a look into Monte Carlo. Uh, Monte Carlo is essentially you want to um, sample um, of like a set of uh, decisions and you know you're based on your, for example, in the Pangman game, you need to make a lot of decisions and, and the, the way the, the, the routes that the, you know, the paths you are taking and, and the choices you're doing. So you, it's basically capturing um, many sets of uh, choices and their results. Um, and so, for example, in here, we're looking at this uh, screen Monte Carlo method, if you use that, basically you look at uh, Pac-Man is right here in the screen here. It has two choice, either turn right or turn left. And in this case, it decides, okay, it's random because there is no, uh, nothing in, in your knowledge base to tell it what it is. So it takes a random, make a random decision, turn right. So now in this case, it gains a point and by eating a pill. Um, and as such, you know, in the next point, then it has like three other choices it can do. So at this point too, it, it keeps going, for example. And so then like um, you want to probably go from like one point to another, uh, you know, another point and you build, then build up all of these, uh, 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 what you call the the matrix of of all your uh, decision, your vector, um, the vector that consists of your moves, you know, for for that particular case. And so now, then you can then go back and then um, essentially make another, uh, you know, choice. And if you know, in this case too, if you say you go back, you can actually move 
like you know make dif different moves to and uh, achieve at the same point and then and so on and so forth so you try to sample a lot of moves um, and the decisions and you capture those at the very end uh, after sampling for a huge sample because you need a lot in order to determine which particular set of moves actually gives you the best score so in this case you look at it monte carlo is essentially requires you to build up a lot of sampling in order to uh, make a decision so as such you can you can tell right it's it's basically maybe not the best decision. So let's take a look into tree search. So in tree search, um, here is an example of a four by three uh, small grid we just want to illustrate. Um, the idea of all of these is to look for an optimized uh, way of achieving your goal. So in this case, we have Pac-Man in here in the lower left uh, grid, and it has to try to reach a pill that's actually in the center up there. So at this point, it, has, it can have two choices of move, uh, move right or move up. And so let's take a look in your tree search, you could um, move right. And so now you can take a look too, and it's building up your tree. And then it, it basically so on and so forth at every point, then it does makes its next move and uh, it keeps going. And you kind of basically start building up your tree um, based on the, the decision it makes and the action it has. And so then you now build up and and then you can then look into this path that you have taken and determine a score that's um, essentially measuring how efficient it is, this particular method. So now in this case, I, the Pac-Man decides to take a right and it kind of has to go through all of these nodes and many steps in order to, to reach the next pill. So how about um, it then, of course, then you take a look and it gives you a score, let's say of 30 at this point. And so now let's say, uh, how about we experiment with another, you know, uh, you know, a different decision. So in this case, how about we move up? Um, so by moving up, you actually will have uh, a more efficient uh, route because then let's take a look at this. At this point, you know, you move up and then you have three more choices and then you basically say, okay, let me keep going right. And basically at this point, you are already there at your destination. So over here too, then, as you can see, the tree search now will give you a score of 40 in this case. So relatively speaking, it is you know, a higher score because it is actually a more efficient and requires like less effort to reach your goal. So as you can see, like um, both methods, they are trying to reach and optimize um, you know, a, a way of um, reaching your goal and trying to analyze and on the most promising moves. But how about this? You know, you look at both. Um, they will both require a lot of sampling, which means that um, the you know the the choices are many. So again, you know, it runs into the problem of you know it's going to perform, it's going to suffer when you need to like sample such a huge data set. So how about then we combine the Monte Carlo and tree search together? And it's basically we're trying to expand on the search tree um, based on this random, random sampling of the search space. So then let's take a look at some illustration. Monte Carlo tree search is basically um, as uh, fundamentally like four steps. So first you do a selection. So at your beginning note, uh, you are then presented with your next um, you know, set of uh, possibility of making a move. And if you look at the choice you have, uh, what this is doing is that you want to select the, the next uh, uh, node that actually gives you the best score. And in this case, in this case, like a higher score. So if we know ahead of time, then we, you know, in this particular case, you choose three because that gives you the higher, higher, highest uh, score. So you take that and basically then you decide, I'm not gonna go through the one and two because three already, it gives me like a head start. I'm already like, you know, have getting more points by going this route. And then based on this, then you go to your next level, you expand on it and you do the same thing, you're making a decision. And if you reach a point in which you have three other choices that are of equal um, kind of score or possibility, you basically like do a random, you say, okay, we don't know which one, but we'll just, pick one. In this case, we pick the one on the right most. And from here on, we keep like expanding it. You do simulation, you keep going down uh, this tree, you make the decision and, and then you keep going and eventually then you will uh, reach your uh, destination. In this case, then in order to calculate then what you need to do, you need to update your score of your parents. You need to do what is called a back propagation. You go back up your tree um, and, and then you cal calculate and get your 
points um, that way. So, and also then let, let's take a look, right? So you can also like then take a look and say, okay, well, um, in, you know, it, and you basically then uh, have your parent uh, kind of store the score. So in this case, and this is what we are seeing in here. So in this case, then you repeat the same procedure. You, you go through like the selection again and you pick the highest score and then you expand on it and you do simulation, you traverse all your node. And basically from there, then you kind of back, back propagate back up and build up. So in this case, you can see too, is that we, we're trying to eliminate the number of um, uh, sort of like rep repetitive uh, decision. If you already know that, you know, by following a certain path, the parent, if it has higher score, you want to kind of keep with that route. So that should give you um, an advantage, uh, you know, in this case. So that's like a Monte Carlo tree search. However, like with this uh, particular tree search too, as you can see, it would still require you um, a lot of sampling in order to know if your choice is actually the best. So um, it requires a, a finite game state and will definitely require a lot of memory in order to keep up with, with how much information you need to store. So what are some of the other um, kind of choices of uh, mechanisms? So let's take a look. You know, we've looked into evolutionary algorithms. And, and it is kind of an interesting um, kind of way of doing things because as such, evolutionary um, algorithms is based on genetic programming. And genetic programming as such is, um, it borrows idea from the biology, from uh, biology of evolution, uh, genetic uh, algorithms. So say basically selection of the fittest and uh, and uh, like mutation and, and as such, uh, principles of such. So it's interesting to kind of look at sequencing and then you, you can then uh, make decisions uh, based on these uh, information. Um, as such too, evolutionary algorithms is possibly not for all cases, but the thing is for playing Pac-Man game actually has been, uh, or any other game, uh, this kind of decision-making is actually popular because um, it helps, uh, it's, it helps to, um, in, in making like data classification. And it's real good for solving like optimization type of problem. And in a game such as Pac-Man, because you have a lot of decision to make, you know, at any one point you're, you're having like, either you may go forward, you gain a point in eating pills, but yet there's a ghost coming, that type of stuff, that kind of scenario makes it kind of a perfect candidate for doing genetic algorithm, use, using genetic algorithms. Um, and also too, the good thing about it is that you have incomplete set of information ahead of you. So this actually evolutionary algorithm is supposed to be like, like a good choice. So um, as such too, the algorithms has uh, two different, two major different uh, types of algorithmic uh, way of doing things. One is the genetic evolution. The other is a grammatical evolution. Grammatical uh, one is actually interesting. The, um, I also have some code to kind of quickly show you is that um, the grammatical one is basically you are uh, translating your, your um, your parameters, like using numbers in order to represent all of your uh, sequencing and data too. So to kind of sum it up in a layman's term. So as such too, for genetic operators, uh, uh, I want to bring up too is that there's a the concept of genetic operators. So basically it's used in genetic algorithms um, to basically guide you towards a solution uh, for the problem. And there are three main types. And as such, they are kind of... Um, uh, imitate also the bio, biology, biological evolutionary uh, concepts. So they are mutation and also crossover and selection. So these kind of maps to like biological senses, mutation is diversity. Crossover is like a recombination is basically like um, reproduction and they're, you know, you always combine two and then you come up with the better one. You combine the two and you select the better one and it's like a crossover. And also then ultimately it's like survival of the fittest. So in a computation terms, it's basically um, genetic algorithms is, is trying to find the, the fitness uh, value of all of your decisions. So over here, just again, a quick uh, explanation. Genetic evolution is you take uh, two sequences of uh, uh, you know, the data and you basically then uh, combine the two. And over here too, then it comes up, uh, what your result in, resulting is you generate a better sequence. Um, it's again by principle of like mutation and crossover, you always will have a uh, better selection uh, with what you have generated from the two. Okay. 
So again, uh, grammatical evolution, which I mentioned a little bit, you basically <clears throat> is using functions, you're tuning these uh, parameters. And the nice thing about it is that it's, it's basically mapped to the program grammatically. Um, again, I mean, I'm just simplifying things here, but essentially you are uh, translating all your choices and sort of map it to some numerical representation. Um, so just maybe a quick, quick look to, I mean, rather than just talking and just some code to quickly show you, um, let me see if I can, uh, I guess I'll have to, oh, like I have to share my screen. Um, okay. Okay, let me, um, okay. So this is just a uh, example uh, of a research paper that we have come across to, um, but just quickly showing you, um, I was hoping to run it, but there's been some uh, issue. And also we have a bit of a limited time, but you're welcome too. I just want to quickly show you. So if you're interested in into uh, somewhat deeper too. And uh, basically this library is an experimental library called Jaco. Um, so Jaco here has the algorithms and uh, and basically wanted to show you the, again, I was uh, talking about these genetic operators. So I was highlighting crossover or mutation and selection, all of these things. So of course, if you're interested too, you can kind of take into here. I was hoping to show like a crossover, for example, like LHS, and this is like, you know, one of these computation here. If you kind of take a look into it, it's basically this library will, will do all of these things for you uh, kind of quite uh, easily. So, but um, again, um, this is actually in my, uh, in, in my uh, GitHub repo. So, and I have also listed at the, at the very end in there. Um, so, so if you're interested in it too, you can kind of take a look into here. And, uh, and I basically also wanted to maybe show the Pac-Man controller too. Um, so basically too, there's also like an, a nicer tree uh, kind, of, uh, kind of way of, uh, okay, let's take a quick look too. The nicer tree will essentially, uh, you know, basically execute and get moves. And so it's just some uh, sam code sample to show you that this isn't just about talking. So, okay. So I think uh, I do have kind of limited time. So I'll kind of, uh, Go back to the to the talk, um, and uh, Ola can share. Thank you. Okay, so I'll go back in here now and uh, just uh, quickly talk about that's the grammatical evolution. And please take a look if you're interested. And uh, the code. And oh, let me a little too fast. And so. Um, However, um, I mean, I spent a bit more time on that because it's an interesting uh, algorithms. And also um, there are actually uh, financial applications too that take advantage of like genetic algorithms. For example, you are like predicting some company, their stocks, you know, their bonds, you know, how it variates over time. And you basically can play around with the numbers. So that's why I wanted to highlight that. It's not just for games and there are some practical usages using that algorithms. Now, coming back to us uh, talking about gaming, in this case, uh, Pac-Man, we are still kind of thinking, this is not, you know, it, as much as it seems like it will be a good um, approach, but we found out it's probably not the ideal because it requires you still some domain knowledge and some finite uh, game state and uh, requires like a long running evaluation function. Now, if you really go take the code and run it, the evaluation part is actually, you can variate all your parameters, parameters but it, it does require a long time to evaluate because you're trying to uh, go through all of your sequencing and basically generate better ones. So as you can see, it's not a very efficient man. So now um, I've spent so much time on it. Let's kind of take a look at the next one. Uh, let's take a look at uh, artificial neural networks. I mean, everybody talks about it now. Um, there are essentially, uh, this one has, uh, well, artificial neural networks, first of all. It's basically, you mimic the human brains, you know, the neurons, how they travel through, you know, th through your uh, mind. And it's basically translated to doing computation. So you basically can, can configure it as policy networks. And so it's kind of like uh, reinforcement learning, which we'll talk about in a little bit. Some decisions and actions are involved. Um, you're trying to learn like optimal playing strategies. You want to like repeat, you know, this training over time. So in some ways it's like reinforcement learning, though it isn't quite like that, but it, it makes use of those principles. And uh, so uh, just to show you too, um, in picture, this is what it is. And basically you have input signal. It's basically coming in some input and you have that first layer that takes your input. And basically from there, then it passed through many layers. Um, it takes your, your input 
and basically pass through all the layers. And over here is just simplifying, we're showing one hidden layer, but in reality, you can have many layers. And basically each layer is essentially will come out with a better signal that goes out to your output layer. So that's what uh, essentially it is. So you see that the input signal going to right is like feed forward of the input signal. And basically, and you can back propagate to of any error signal. And in this case, um, I'll also go into the next slide and explain a little bit. Um, again, this is in a nutshell. There are two types of, uh, or primary types of uh, artificial uh, neural networks. They're feed forward, and uh, an example of such is the convolutional uh, neural networks. And as such, they will be ideal for doing image processing. Uh, because it's kind of like it goes one way. It just goes from input, hidden layers, and output, and then and then that's it. So for image processing, 2D processing is a, is a good way um, of utilizing it. And then there's also recurrent uh, neural networks too. As such, rec recurrent will take more effort because it goes back, it feeds back, and all the errors, it goes back. And basically, the idea is that you want to eliminate errors. So then you take into having had to calculate what are the errors you want to eliminate by every single like you know forward action to it. So now, oops, I think I did a little too fast. So um, as such, right, um, artificial neural network sounds. Wow, it sounds like, you know, kind of amazing. And But the thing is, we're just doing Pac-Man in here. So you may ask, you know, do we need to, something like so complicated? And it's, you know, let's take a look. We talk about reinforcement learning. So this is when we kind of realize, wow, reinforcement learning is the perfect answer to us in Q learning. It's basically um, an action outcome-based education. You continue the progressive learning. And the nice thing about it, nicest, is that because in every game situation, you don't know what will happen and things can happen, you know, in any ways. So it makes it kind of an ideal candidate because it, you really don't need to know a lot of domain knowledge. And why? It's because of the concept of, you know, the, the rewards. So going a bit more into reinforcement learning, there are essentially like six uh, kind of areas we want to pay attention to. So there's agent. Um, so in kind of more traditional supervised uh, machine learning where you build up a, a known model and all that, it has a supervisor that basically supervises what actions to take. But in reinforcement learning, it has the concept of agent. Agent is there, is kind of acting on your behalf, making decision based on some input if it's already there. If it isn't, if you start the game, it will be random. So anyway, so there's the agent trying to make a decision based on some uh, feed, you know, in, and then there's, uh, an environment in which you operate, where the agent is operating. And the, the ultimately, you want to see what the reward is. So then based on the reward, you, base, um, you build up your knowledge repository. And then from there, based on the reward, you know what scores you get, you know, on the kind of moves you're taking given that particular uh, state. So which gets into the state. And state is basically a reflection of that particular point in time, you know, your, your state and also to how it is, um, as it execute policy. So without getting all the details, policy are more like, you know, some sort of like uh, moves you make, you know, and so you, you set up policy based on that and because of it, it's affected by what rewards you have to. And then the value essentially is, is the value function is basically explaining, you know, is, is, is it actually um, give you any kind of value from that particular move. Yeah, sounds um, oh. really interesting. So let's take a look a little bit closer at this one. I like it. Sure. Like in contrast to the previous one, it seems pretty straightforward. Yeah. Like all the components are simple and yeah, nothing, nothing sophisticated in there. So sure. can you explain a little bit more how it fits to to our use case? I mean, a, a sure. Pacman use case as well as distributed Pacman use case. Sure. So yeah. So if you look at like Pacman, at every um, you know scenario, it's it's a, it's a great metaphor, in fact, of reinforcement learning because you can actually see the environment as a grid, you know. And so it's a grid of it's make, making all the movements. So in this case, like agent comes in making a decision, and and basically it will look up, you know, if there's a knowledge already built up, it knows what to do. It's basically okay. I don't even need to. So to speak, think, you know, based on what I have, I kind of make the next move based on the knowledge. But if it isn't already there, I'll make a random decision. And so basically, too, in this case, you have Pac-Man making, you know, in this case, making a, either a right move or a left move. In this case, it decides, okay, let's do a right. And then based on this, you basically have an outcome of, you know, a, a positive outcome because you ate a pill. And the pill gives you 10 points. So look at the scoreboard. You get 10 points. You get higher points. You get a reward. And so, so my question is, yeah, my, my question is, we have this, this kind of action and we have this kind of 
outcome, but how it, how it useful for us for us then? Sure. Yeah. So yeah, for this outcome, we don't just throw it away. So what we do is, you know, again, we go back to here. We make a decision, some outcome, and then the knowledge. You basically take the knowledge and you build. Build up your knowledge repository. Think of it like a repository. Oh, this is good knowledge. Let me store it so it can be referenced for future. So then, the future, you come across this particular move at this particular state and scenario. You can kind of basically make the decision. Um, so here, uh, you kind of make the decision, and uh, basically, um, in this case, we animated, we gain ten points, and all that. So that's what it yeah. is. So yeah, looks looks interesting. However, I'm seeing problem here. First of all, what I've seen is that you have to have kind of really similar state or like identical state in order to make the same decision. So it's it's not that not that sophisticated and it may lead to the following. In our case we have kind of continuously changing environment. For example, if you add a pill, another pill will, will appear at a different point. So it will be really, really low chance that the same state will, will be over time again. I mean, because of the huge map and randomly generated pills at newer positions. At the same time, we have continuously changing number of, of players. So for example, it was one, one Pac-Man and one Ghost, and now we have plus one Ghost. So it's totally different state. So how it's useful then? And finally, having this like, the combination of of continuously changing number of of all these parameters we will just just blows up our computer because we will have to store everything in order to use it. So it it seems a little bit uh, useless. So can we fix that a little bit somehow, Mary? Sure. Okay. Let's take a look. Um, so we kind of look at more, look at it more. And we found out a even better way is called a case-based reasoning. So as such, it's an improvement over the, the strictly like a pure reinforcement learning. So let's take a look. Case-based reasoning is basically you're building still, you are based on the knowledge, you, you reason of things and based on the knowledge and you still kind of build on your knowledge base. And what it's kind of different is that you try to find similarities in all of your moves. Right. So, for example, I'm making pancakes. I'm uh, trying to have a recipe of making plain pancakes and recipe of making blueberry pancakes. I mean, the steps are pretty similar until you get to the point of blueberries. You need to add blueberries, maybe some extra steps to that. So why don't we kind of use this kind of same analogy? Let's not you know, spend our time repeating things that we already know. So if you identify patterns, you basically then say, OK, we already know something and we'll just uh, uh, find these similarities and kind of apply the differences to each particular scenario. So in likewise, that's what it is. And so you find you're using this uh, keep it simple rule because you need to make the decision. You want to keep your uh, particular scenario simple. So then it helps to, to make your decision um, a lot quicker without kind of complicating the scenario. Um, so that's what essentially case-based reasoning is uh, to summarize it. And, and basically to you, it, it's, it, it's a form of like reinforcement learning or an extension, I may say, of expanding on reinforcement learning. So you still like gather your knowledge and you kind of build up um, onto your knowledge base is, is what it is. So, and uh, okay. So yeah, in summary. Sounds really, sounds really interesting. In general, what I, what I understood is that like kind of it, reinforcement learning, first of all, allows us to, 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 to be continuous. So it's kind of continuous learning, which is, which is good for us because this is kind of online game. So if you, if you run a bot, this bot will be continuously improving its knowledge, which is, which is awesome. I like it. I mean, I can imagine the game which is improving continuously over time, always. That's, that's amazing. And what you can see that case-based reasoning is a kind of enforcement of reinforcement learning. So it optimizes memory usage, usage. It, it, it kind of simplifies the state so we can, we can look at the most important Things like the closest field, the closest ghost, the corners, the general kind of pattern of, of, of the maze at this point of, of, of stain, for example. So it's, it's kind of improving the, 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 the general good, good approach. So I like it. So yes. finally, we can start using reactive streams. Yeah. yeah. That's right. Yes. So now we are arrived at this point. So yeah. So why reactive streams? Oh, like maybe you can 
give us uh, more in-depth uh, knowledge into this area, you know, among other choices. So, um, of yeah. course, of course, absolutely. Nowadays, everybody is talking about reactive streams, about streaming. But you may wonder why? Why is this so trendy? First of all, I have to say that we have to think about challenges that we have today. And first of all, we have challenges in 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 like not in only in like microservices and distributed system, but in machine learning scenarios. And for example, one of the scenarios is traffic prediction. This is one of the most efficient use cases how you can apply machine learning. And if you think, well, if you build a model and you'll try to apply it again and again and again, you will figure out that it, it works. However, everything is changing. Everything is evolves basically. All rules are changing over time and you have to, you have to improve yourself over time continuously. So you have to consume all the data that are coming in over time and you have to improve, continuously improve, improve your data. So it's kind of stream of data, right? Another use case is, is marketing activities. And this is one of the super important use cases where machine learning have to be super fast, especially when the market is changing. So you have continuously consumed data all this information, like analyze it, build new model on top of this data using the previous knowledge and then produce new results, new predictions. So it's kind of important here to, to be evolving and continuously updating um, like their self and models over time. And the same applicable for spam filters because we like hackers evolves, our software have to evolve as well along with hackers. So we have to analyze all the data over time, almost in real time. So everything that, that we look at, all the different topics where, can, where we can apply machine learning should evolve over time. And basically, if we, if we look like from the high point of view, we will figure out that this case is all related to data streaming because like all this information is nothing more than stream of data, right? And the same, applicable for, for gaming because nowadays we have different kind of games. And you may imagine that you are playing with a bot in the same team. For example, you're playing in Counter-Strike, right? So you want to have bot that evolves over time based on, on, on for example, on your enemy uh, behaviors on, or on your behaviors. So this is important that your, your, your game is evolving along with you. So this, this would be cool. So coming back to Pac-Man, if you look at the Pac-Man in general, sorry, what sorry, we are doing, guys, we are supplying good. a stream, right? So this is kind of a controller that we have. We are saying up, right, down, left. And this is basically a stream of actions in this case. Yeah, nothing more than a stream of actions. And unfortunately, nowadays, all the implementation of this stream of data is, it looks like like pool model. It's pretty imperative. It says, well, let's let's consume the action of controller Let's cons consume the actions of ghosts because everything is local, right? So you, you may find out such implementations in, in, for example, all these implementations of machine learning approaches for, for competition. And of course it can work. Yeah, nothing, nothing special here if, if this is ran in, on the same machine in, in the local hardware where everything kind of happens immediately. However, if you think about distributed case, about our case, our controller is over the network. And the problem with network is that it's first of all, first of all unreliable and then it's slow. So once you've done an action, Pokemon start moving and it moved away, away from what you wanted to do as the next step. So what I'll we let, have to do- I'll let, I'm yep. sorry to you, but just a heads up that you have around four or five minutes left on the presentation. Yeah, thank you for, for letting me know. Um, so in general, um, what we have to do, we have to, to apply a different approach. We have to observe and react to actions when they come. So instead of like, you know, this, this approach, it's basically observer approach or observer model. And uh, it's well known. So when you, when you do an action, it's a synchronous approach. You have a handler to which you can put your observer. And once an action happened, you can do some, some, some results. And it will build much better because this is asynchronous and it doesn't require you to continuously pull and do actions. And of course, you know, this is well known fact that observer model is, is not the best approach. So over time it evolved in something called streams 
or reactive streams. And reactive streams is a kind of standard approach for doing streaming. First of all, it's a proper streaming abstraction. It allows you to build chain of asynchronous like pipes or actions. And then uh, it provides you with a set of standardized interfaces in many languages like Java, C Sharp, Python, .NET, uh, GS. So you can, you can use the same standard set of interfaces in order to communicate between even different platforms. And finally, it's a perfect API design approach and it works for monolith case as well as for distributed system. And first of all, yeah, just quickly let you know what is it, what it is. It gives you four interfaces, just three most important is publisher, subscriber, and subscription. And it brings another approach, call it kind of back prayer in order to keep your system stable. But yeah, we'll be talking about that a little bit later. So let me quickly show you a demo uh, of this approach. So first of all, what we've taken, we've taken the most standard template for, for building Pac-Man and we rewrote it in, in, in some streaming way. So as we say, we have kind of in our machine learning approach, in our reinforcement learning approach, for four important state, uh, kind of steps or functions in our pipeline, which analyze stream of data. And first of all, we have kind of controller. Controller is kind of decision maker. So if you want to write a bot, yeah, so this is like kind of our application. This is implementation. I'll be sharing links afterwards. We are running out of time, so I don't want to spend much time here. In general, streaming approach allows you to build really straightforward and clean pipeline, which works kind of in local environment. So for example, in this case, I'm using in memory knowledge repository, but yeah, we will see later what we can do. And then we can, we can build up a pipeline. So I'll be quick. I don't want to write it everything myself. So first of all, it's, you, you should imagine everything as a stream. And first of all, controller is a stream. So it represented as Flux, for example, or Publisher. Flux is, is from Project Reactor. It's one of the implementation of Publisher. So you consume all these actions and then you apply some, some transformations like game engine can accept all the decision you do and provide you with outcome. So it's kind of the next step in your pipeline. Yeah, and it looks pretty, pretty kind of imperative, but it's fully asynchronous and allows you to continuously consume stream of data. And then you say, well, we have to apply some machine learning approaches. So we have to consume this outcome, this action, and we have to learn something from me. And learn function, for example, can be, can be like that. So it consumes a stream of, of, of outcomes from, from our game engine. And then it provides, provides a, a knowledge base it on, on some machine learning implementation. And then of course we can store this or educate our knowledge base and then somehow reuse this knowledge using for example, search. So this is, it looks pretty, pretty straightforward. It looks pretty imperative. However, it's fully asynchronous. So right now it works kind of on the same machine. We are connecting to our remote game right now. So we are running this app and yeah, just, 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 yeah, let me. Mary, yep. I'm really sorry. Uh, we're really running out of time, so we need to wrap up because there's already other speakers waiting to start a talk. Um, yeah, sure. So yeah, let's let's keep it for now. Uh, let's go back to to the very end. I believe we are running out of time, so let's do our best. Okay. Um, in general, with reactive stream approach, first of all. You can, you can easily distribute your system because streaming is, is not related to only a single machine. You can, you can split your stream over the wire, over the network. And what you can build in order to improve your machine learning approach is, for example, you can, you can kind of build a distributed set of, of, of computers which are connected and listening to a stream of actions and then produce some outcomes to the same single machine which collect and process some outcome later. So you can apply this approach for many, uh, for many, for many cases. Yeah, we are not going to to spend much time. Let's let's summarize what we what we look at this um, at this session. Mary, go ahead. Oh sure. Okay. So yeah, we have to like summarize now. So basically, we have concluded reinforcement learning is a good model for uh, and less te technique for continuous learning, and it fits very well even for like online pac too. 
Um, and basically, reactive streams, as you can see, all I can, can explain quickly, is really a natural approach for such cases and enables like real-time processing. And I think it's really will be like really promising for doing uh, machine learning training. And it works good locally and as well as in distributed environments. So we're like highly advocating for that. And okay, so um, yeah, we just have to come to this uh, and then show you all the resources. We'll make these uh, slides available to you. This is These are our, our Twitter handles. And then uh, these are the uh, different links to the different uh, topics that we've talked about, reactive streams, reactive foundation, the machine learning, reinforcement learning, artificial intelligence, that uh, the book by uh, Russell and Nor Norvik, and that's a good book. Also uh, by uh, Richard Sutton and Andrew Bartol too, that's a great book on reinforcement learning too, if you're interested. Then there's also the paper that we looked at is here, Pacman Conquers Academia, that particular one uh, IEEE paper. And also then uh, the sample code too for the genetic algorithms as well as our uh, grammatical evolution. So we'll make these uh, available to you. Additional resources is IBM Cloud is free tier if you want to sign up for that and our newsletter as well as the code today that uh, L, um, I guess Oleg didn't get to it, but it, it is available in here if you're interested. And we are always open to listening to any questions you have, suggestions, and we're interested in the continuous conversation. So, yeah. And Oleg, you have any more um, to say? Yep. That's it. Okay. Thank you for your attention. And Thank you. I wasn't able to, to show everything, but yes. this talk is available online, so you're welcome mm -hmm. to, to finalize your, your watching um, at, at, the, at the different la link at YouTube. Oh, I'll let you. Maddie, thank you so much. I'm so sorry thank that you, we Leon. ran out of time. It was a very interesting presentation. Um, and I would really uh, encourage you to also share these links on the Slack channel for the ones okay. who are interested. Um, and also maybe later on on the YouTube channel if we're allowed to do so. Um, thank you very much for your talk. It was really great. Uh, and this was also my last session for today. So thank you guys for joining in. Uh, in the next session, we have Roberto as a host. So enjoy it and see you later. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Okay. Have a good day, everyone. Bye-bye.